Good morning. How are you guys doing? Maybe you remember me. I've been here before. Oh, good. That's great. Nobody. Okay. Well, in our family, we say that there's a fine line between a memory and a scar. So <laughs> hopefully I didn't leave too bad of it. Uh, a taste in your mouth. Yeah, my name's David. Um, I live up in Portland in, by Beaverton, actually, is where my wife Sunshine and I live. And uh, that is her real name, by the way. If most, some people know Sunshine. If you meet my wife Sunshine, from then on, I'm Sunshine's husband. And so that's all you need to know. Um, but we serve, I serve in the, the, what's the Northwest District of Foursquare, one of the associate supervisors. And if you don't know what the Northwest District is, it is Alaska, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Wyoming, Montana, and North Dakota. So yeah, I work with a lot of our churches in pastoral transitions and church and health. So yeah, I get to do that. But today, I love being here, get to bring the word, love your pastors. Uh, Pastor Greg, Pastor Stacy are good friends. I don't even know if you guys, I mean, you probably know this, right? That I love that they're friends. I love that I get to work with them in Foursquare, but they're, they're our area pastors. You guys know that? They're area pastors. So if you don't know what that is, they do a phenomenal job of serving about 20 some different churches in their area. And they're, uh, they're, one of their roles is to care for and lead and love in those areas. And they do just a phenomenal job with that. So I love that I get to serve with them in that too. But by the way, how many of you are excited? I, I get geeked up about tr Trunk or Treat. Do you guys like that? Like, okay, here's the deal. Okay, so, so from a missiological perspective, let's look at tomorrow, all right? Because we're like, oh, it's Halloween. Missiologically speaking, what other time of the year does your entire neighborhood come out of their houses and come to yours? All right, I live with a few hard and fast rules in my life. One, you buy whatever children are selling on the side of the road right? If kids come to my house and they're selling cookie dough, I'm going to buy it. And when Halloween comes around, I'm giving out the best candy in the neighborhood, right? Oh, also tip really well after church on Sundays. That's the other one that you should do. If you go out to eat, please be nice to your food server and tip really well because you should, all right? Because they all know you came from church and we should just be Jesus to our food servers. Because if you've ever worked food service on a Sunday, you know what I'm talking about. All right. Hey, listen, we're going to be in the book of Jonah today. Jonah is where we're going to be. <laughs> Woohoo! Everybody's like, oh, good. Okay, so I want to talk today, actually, Jonah, the story of Jonah. We're going to talk about a story of God's grace. And we're going to see it in the book of Jonah uh, in some pretty incredible ways. So something to know about this book, a little bit of history on this. Jonah is one of what we call the 12 minor prophets. Now, when you read scripture and you talk about the minor prophets, it just means because they're shorter, not because they're less important. It's not like this is the lesser section of the Bible. That's not what the minor prophets mean. And so we're talking about this is Jonah lived around the 8th century BC. He's only mentioned elsewhere in scripture in 2 Kings. And actually, they're not sure who wrote this book because they don't think Jonah wrote this book. Especially if you see how they talk about Jonah, you're like, I don't think he wrote this book. Now, here's the thing Jonah is different than the other minor prophets because. A couple of different reasons. First of all, the other prophets, they record, you know, a lot of these different prophecies. And Jonah has one story and only one prophetic message that he brings. Now, he's also different from other writings in the Old Testament, right? So he's, he's a little different. We're going to talk about Jonah, our very different prophet today. All right, so in the Old Testament, you know, we have things like laments and we have parables and histories. And Jonah's this prophetic message. It's kind of like we call it a prophetic narrative. It's a story, right, that, that's, that's about a very specific message that he's been given. And it's a little different because a lot of the other prophets, <laughs> the, the story focuses on the prophets from the standpoint of the man of God, you know, that is the prophet, the story of the man of God that is the prophet. Their obedience is central to the story. Well, Jonah is different because one, he's a prophet that was actually called to bring a message, like not to his own people, but to a foreign nation. And two, Jonah is different because of his response to God when he was given the message. Because if you're not familiar with that, you have like stories like, you know, you've got all these different other prophets, Jeremiah saying, I'm too young, but I'll go. Isaiah saying, here I am, send me. And you've got Jonah who says, here I am, I ain't going. Like, I'm not going. 
oh, no way. I mean, it is flat out. God says, I want you to do something. And he goes, nope. We all laugh, but how, I don't know if you've ever done this. You ever read scripture and try to find yourself in the story? Like, where am I in this story? The older I get, the less I am the hero of the story. The, the less, the older I get, the more I don't think so badly about the Israelites. When, you know, like you start, you know, you read about the Israelites. How could they disobey God? How, I don't know. How could they? And then I look at my own life and go, uh, oh, oh, wait right? So we will find ourselves somewhere in the story of Jonah, right? Now, here's the other thing I want to lay out here before we're jumping in. Sometimes when we read the Old Testament, we read like there's the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament, and somehow we make them separate. They're not separate. This is the same God that when we're singing in worship to, this is the same God, same God of the Old Testament, same God of the New Testament. And that's important because I'm going to ask you to do something today as we jump into Jonah. I'm going to ask you to hold on to a scripture, and we'll come back to it toward the end, but you're familiar with it. John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. So I just want you to kind of tuck that away and hold on to it, right? So now let's jump into Jonah. I got a little background of what's going on there. I want to talk about, the first thing I want to talk about here is running from grace. This is what it says. Jonah chapter 1, verse 1, it says this. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Right off the bat, if you're wondering what this book is about, it is right there. God gives him a message. He goes, no, and then he's running from God. So there is like no secret to what we're talking about here. So Jonah hears this, this prophetic message, this very clear direction, and he's supposed to go to Nineveh. Nineveh is a you know, large city in Assyria, like that would be north, northeastern, north, northern Iraq is where that would be today. And it's an enemy nation of non-Jewish people who were not loved by Israel. And Jonah does not say no, he literally runs in the opposite direction. So to give you some perspective, this would be like if we were where we live, it would be like if you were living in Bend, Oregon, and God says, I want you to go to Missoula, Montana, and you go, okay, and then it and it, instead you head straight to the coast and jump on a boat for Hawaii. That's the distances. Hey, go to Missoula. I'm heading to Hawaii. Now, most people would be like, all right, well, I'll head to Hawaii instead, but like running from God. So for the record, if you've ever felt bad about not listening to when the Lord speaks to you, you can flip over to Jonah and be like, okay, I see some things here. So the, the book of Jonah will later reveal, by the way, as you read through it, and I'm just going to share it here, but you read it toward the end, why the prophet's desire to run away from God's calling. Why was he running? Was it because it was hard? What was the reason? Well, it's revealed later, and it's really simple. Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh because he knew if he did, that the people of Nineveh, of that city that he does not like, would hear the message of the Lord and possibly repent. And then God, who he knows is gracious and merciful, would forgive them and show them grace. And that is not anything that Jonah wanted to be a part of. The reason why he's running from God is because he does not like the Ninevites. And he knows that if he goes and shares the message of God, there's a possibility they'll repent. And if they repent, he knows God's heart. So he's running for a way because he doesn't want them to receive grace. Here's the thing, by the way, about God's grace. All of us run from it. At some way or in another in our life, we've run from God's grace. In fact, if we're honest with ourselves... Sometimes we don't even like grace. You're like, wait, no, I love grace. See, on the one hand, we can struggle with the grace of God. When we talk about God's grace, we're talking about that unmerited favor of God, right? 
Sometimes we struggle with the idea of God's love and mercy and grace that we cannot earn. So our battle is our self-worth because grace doesn't require that we create a self that is worthy. Right? So we can actually struggle with God's grace because we're like, you know what? I'm really good with working hard about making myself better. And by the way, if our Christian faith has become where we're like, look, my whole life is about doing right instead of doing wrong and making myself a better person and more presentable to God, then we're going to struggle with grace because instead of God's grace, we like to have a life constructed by our own abilities. And when we're faced with God's grace, we go, well, Lord, I, <laughs> this is really on it. Like, Lord, I know your grace is there, but check what I did. So we can run from God's grace because it's a free gift. And we're like, I, I see your free gift and I raise you my own effort. The, on the other end of the spectrum, the life grace requires of us can be frustrating and difficult. Because when we realize, like Jonah did, that God's grace and mercy even extends to those that we don't like or consider or even the people we hate, that God's grace is available to them. So we can struggle with grace like Jonah did. So when we look at Jonah and we're like, man, Jonah, Jonah ran away. And he ran away from God because he didn't want God's grace to be extended to a group of people that he didn't like. He wasn't going, he, they were not like him. Where do we see ourselves in God's grace? Do we receive his grace and we recognize, look, I can't earn this grace. I live in response to that. But also, how do I see others through the lens of the grace of God? And are there people on that list? And I'm going to talk about that in a minute, about what that list looks like, where we struggle with the grace of God because he could extend grace to people that we've put on the list that shouldn't have it. Right? And it's so quiet. Hope it's not as quiet online. No, I'm just kidding. So let's talk about this idea, right? So we, so we got Jonah and he's running away. And that was the first thing. I want to talk now about this unlooked for grace. So if you go and read in, in chapter 2 of Jonah, you go and read for the unlooked for grace. One of the things that you're going to see is you're going to see the story. Jonah's fleeing from God. He gets on the ship. He's heading out. A giant storm comes up which is just an incredible story when you read it. I'm not going to read it all. Read it this week. But you see Jonah, he's on the ship, and they're wondering what's going on. And finally, he's like, it's probably me. And I love it because the sailors go, what did you do? And he's like, well, I, you know, well, I serve the God of the, you know, the one who oversees the land and the heavens and the earth. And I'm, basically, I'm running away from him. And give the sailors some credit. He's like, you should probably just toss me off the ship. And his response, their response is, no, let's try to row back to shore. Like, I, I would have been like, okay. <laughs> so, so they try to row back to shore, and that doesn't work. And so they do chuck him into the ocean, and then everything calms down. And then in verse 17, it says this, And now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. I got to tell you something, and some of you may go, oh, yeah, David, why didn't you pick that up earlier? But for a lot of years when I read these verses, I went back and I was studying these. For a lot of years when I read the verses about Jonah on the ship and then being chucked into the ocean and then the fish swallow him, I read them as, well, yeah, that's what you get from running from God, right? Like you're running from God, you're in the ocean, and, and God sends a fish to suck you up and then vomit you up on the shore, which that's a whole thing kind of serves you right. But when you study this and you look at this passage, you see it very differently in actually how it is. See, Jonah was thrown off of this ship and there was a good possibility he was going to drown. And God sends his grace with fins and scales to save him. He was literally sinking into the water. We're going to read in a minute the prayer that he says from inside the fish. But God's grace to Jonah was in the form of a giant fish that sucked him up. I don't know if any of you like to fish. I love to fish. And um, I love to fly fish. And one of my favorite things to fly fish for is bass. I know everybody trout fishes, but whatever. I've done that a million times. If you've ever fly fished for bass in the evening, you flip out this little fly and it's floating. And all of a sudden, you just <laughs> see the water open up and it just goes Whoa! and disappears. And that's a blast. Yeah, that's Jonah. Whoa! You know, that's, he's gone. But that is God's grace just in the form of a fish. 
to save him from drowning in the sea. And that just seems nuts. I, I thought about this. This fish is really grace personified because Jonah would probably die and this book would be shorter than it already is. It would have been like, and Jonah got swallowed by the fish. And we flip to the next book. Jonah doesn't actually deserve the fish, right? He didn't deserve the fish. He's running from God, right? I mean, here's this thing about this idea of God's grace in the midst of things is that it shows up when we are least worthy and the most broken and the least deserving, right? I mean, I need that grace. Do you know how many people outside of the four walls of the church still have this idea, if they're thinking about religion at all, still have this idea that Christianity is about making ourselves better? I don't know if you've ever had the conversation with somebody that says, well, I'd come to church, but I need to clean my life up. And what, isn't that crazy? That, but that's an ideology that's pervasive. It's out there. It's like, yeah, look, if I come in the church, I need to get my life right. We're like, no, 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 no. That's not how this works right? That's like trying to walk before you're born. It doesn't happen. And so when we talk about God's grace, it shows up in incredible ways. Look, there's a story in Luke 15 you may be familiar with, but in Luke 15, Jesus tells the story about the son who takes the money, his inheritance, and goes off and squanders it and finds himself knee deep in whatever in a pig pen. And then he realizes, I'm going to go back home to my father. And, it, and there's this, this beautiful picture in Luke 15 and verse 21. It says this. He says, the son then said to him, father, he goes back home. And the father's waiting for him, embraces him. And the son says, father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And the father says to his servant, quick, bring the best robes and put it on him and put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate for his son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. So there's this picture of God's grace coming where we don't deserve it. And Jonah is fleeing from God and the fish that swallows him is <laughs> this beautiful picture of God's grace picking him up in the middle of the ocean. I want you to listen in to, to Jonah's prayer and worship from inside the fish. This is what he says. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God, and he said, In my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the current swirled around me, and all your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down, to the earth barred me in forever. But you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. And I'm thinking, in a fish, all right? When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to your holy temple. And those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you that I have vowed I will make good. I will sal say salvation comes from the Lord. Verse 10, and the Lord commanded the fish and it vomited Jonah up onto dry land. There are things in Scripture that we read so, by so quickly, right? That we're like, and yeah, I know the story of Jonah. Can you imagine if you were standing on the shoreline and you saw that happen? That'd be like, well, well, that just happened. Like, that's a thing. And so I'm sure that when Jonah showed up after being in the, the belly of the fish for three days, he was looking good. He's probably smelling good. Here's the thing. Jonah recognizes the grace of God. He recognizes that he was saved even in his running, even in his failure. He was being preserved and he was being given another chance. So now that he's back on land, having experienced the saving grace of God, Jonah follows through with what God has asked of him. You know, God's grace, when we talk about this, this God who's the God of all Scripture, not just the Old Testament God, the New Testament God, this beautiful picture of God's grace, it, it pursues us into places we never thought it would pursue us. Pursues us into our failure, pursues us into our broken. And it brings life even in the places where there should only be death. You know what's interesting? Here's something that I find interesting about being Christians. You know, we're an interesting group. 
if you're in the room and you say you know Jesus, we're kind of, we can be weird. Remember that God's not weird. We do weird things in His name, but God's not weird. But one of the things that I've always found interesting in talking about God's grace, and it pursues us into our failures, what's interesting is over the years of talking with believers, of believing that, except for the areas where they made the mistake. Like, well, Lord, I know that you're gracious, but I made a choice that was bad. And then for some reason we're like, and so there's, there's no hope for me. And I'm like, how can we believe that if we're walking with Jesus? Like, there is a beautiful, one of the most beautiful words in the Bible is the word repentance. It is a gorgeous, beautiful word, and we tend to put it in the realm of like, oh, that's like one of the bad words. Repentance is this beautiful idea of coming to God, changing the way we think and our perspectives, receiving the grace of God and forgiveness. So Jonah, after all of this, he's thrown up on the land, and you can go and you'll read about that. But what happens is, is he does exactly what God asked him to do way back over here. He goes to Nineveh and he begins to proclaim this prophetic word. He's like, hey, in this many days, this city's coming to an end. And it takes him a number of days, the city's so big, to get through the city proclaiming the message of God. When he says, I will do what God asked me to do, he does it. God's grace, God's incredible mercy is extended in powerful ways, not just to Jonah, but here's the thing. This is the part that's amazing. Jonah receives God's grace and is obedient to him and goes and proclaims this message to the city of Nineveh. And now they're open to receive the grace of God. Now they can receive something from God because he's being obedient to do what he's called to do and proclaim the word of the Lord. And by the way, if you go and read, the whole city responds in repentance. Even the king says, you know what? Everybody put on some sackcloth. Don't eat, don't drink for a number of days. Let's repent. Maybe God will turn from this. And he does. And so they receive grace and they have an opportunity to repent and receive life because Jonah walks in obedience because he himself has received the grace of God. Recognize that God's grace is never just about us. Being women and men of God that receive his grace and function and health is not just about us, but it's about people around us because a grace-filled life reaches other people and people can experience it. Hi, my name is David. I'm a recovering legalist. Just so you know, I've been clean for a few years now, but I'm telling you, it's still a battle. If you go back in my life and look, man, I, I, yeah, early on in my walk with Jesus, when I got saved, here's the deal. I literally got saved and someone handed me a Bible and a copy of This Present Darkness. If you're a certain age, you know what that book is. Let me just tell you, don't hand people that book when they first get saved. Because I read that, I read the Bible, I'm like, this is how all it is. Three months after salvation, I'm in Bible college. I didn't know who the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit was. I'd only done the Jesus thing. Like, I was a mess. So what I did was I adjusted my life, and I'm like, okay, I've lived without Jesus this long, right? And my life was, I was voted least likely to ever come to know Jesus by the Christians in my high school. I didn't even know that was a competition. That was great. Let's not have that competition. But uh, I got the gold star on that one. But so what I did was I adjusted my life to be like, okay, rather than God's grace, I'll just do all the right things in my own strength. So I went that direction and then had to realize, well, that doesn't produce anything that's life-giving because anybody that spends time around me, what do they pick up? Legalism. So your life is in order because you do it. Yes. And you're kind of proud of that. Yes. Yes. But walking in grace and obedience, people get to receive the message of God through our lives, and they themselves have an opportunity to respond to the true message, right? I love verse 10, verse 3, 10. When God saw what they, had di- what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, he relented, and he did not bring on them destruction that he had threatened. Okay, last thing here, last point. It's not in conclusion. I'm not going to say it's a conclusion because... You guys all know when a pastor says in conclusion. I'm sure that your pastors don't do that. But most pastors, when they say in conclusion, you're like, we got like 20 minutes. Right? It's like, everybody knows like the Bible has to close or this has to click off. And they're like, okay, now there's, now there's hope. Now there's hope. Okay. <clears throat> Picking up here, Blind Grace, I want to jump in here uh, in, in uh, verse 4 here. It says this. But then Jonah, to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. And he, was, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? 
that this is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. And then the Lord replied, um, is it right for you to be angry? Jonah had gone out and sat down in a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant, made it grow up over Jonah to give him shade for his head and to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. And when the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind. And the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. And he wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. And then God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about this plant? It is, he said. I'm so angry, I wish I was dead. But the Lord said, you've been concerned about this plant, although you did not tend it or make it grow, and it sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? And that's the end of Jonah. That's like how the book ends. You're like, eh, okay, we're just done. <laughs> this is, we're just done with the book of Jonah. So here's the thing. The people of Nineveh, they hear the message of the Lord they respond with humility and repentance. They experience the grace and mercy of God like Jonah knew was going to happen, and he's not happy about it. So here's the thing. Think about the heart attitude. He's experienced the grace of God in the form of the fish. He gets <laughs> spit up on the shore. He goes and proclaims the message of God, but obviously he says he's going to do it, but when he's doing it, he's still hoping that they don't respond. So what he does is he finds a place overlooking the city and waits for its destruction. And when the Ninevites do repent, he literally tells God, I told you so. Didn't I say this would happen? I'm so angry I could die. The man was just saved by God's grace and mercy, just experienced the forgiveness of God, was just saved from drowning. And his, res his response, you guys, his response to the grace to the Ninevites is over my dead body. <laughs> like, I know you said what you said, but I'm going to wait here and I'm open for fire. I mean, like he literally positions himself to be like, bring it on. By the way, I would highly recommend this kind of conversation. I, I, he's, this is a fascinating conversation with the Lord. I told you so that like, okay, Jonah. Listen, Jonah is interesting. He cannot accept the grace of God for those that are not like him. It was good for him, but not for them. So he sets up a spot to watch and see if anything will happen to the city. This whole thing about the plant, God does this to teach him a lesson and show him something. By the way, notice that God asks Jonah twice if he has a right to be angry. Do you remember? Maybe you don't. I don't know. Remember if your parents would ever say to you, so you think that's a good idea, huh? And then you would say, yeah, or whatever, and you'd keep doing it, and they would go, really? So you think that's a good idea. And then you realize I should probably pause because they've asked me twice and I'm about to step in something. You ever do that? So you think that's a good idea. A little bit later, really? And you're like, wait, I think someone's trying to communicate something to me without actually not communicating something to me. Listen, when he talks about this plant and he, he says, listen, you, you had anger over this plant. You didn't do anything. Jonah, Jonah's anger reveals something in his heart here. He was so concerned for the plant. Here's the thing, that he did absolutely nothing for. He did nothing for that plant. It's not like he actually cared for the plant. He didn't care for the plant. He didn't tend the plant. He didn't water the plant. He simply experienced it and enjoyed it. And now he's angry because it's no longer there. Jonah had no genuine love for the plant. It was just convenient for him. So God's telling Jonah this, so you feel bad about this plant, huh? Now imagine how I feel about the people of Nineveh who are created in my image, who are bearing my likeness. 
You're upset about a plant that you literally have no love for, and you're, you're losing your mind over this plant that you have no care for whatsoever. I send you to go to a people that I love deeply, that bear my image, that are created in my likeness. They, they have the, 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 the marks of God on their life. I send you to them. By the way, if you've ever wanted to see the mission of God in action, Jonah is a picture of the mission of God where God is sending people out into the world to people that are other than themselves to proclaim the message of God. And in this picture, he's like, look, you don't care about that plant. Look at my heart toward these people. You get the picture, remember when Jesus is weeping over Jerusalem and it says from the very depth of his being, the word there in the original language, his very depth of his being, his compassion for those people. This is God's heart toward the world. And Jonah's missing it because he doesn't like these people. Jonah's pain is nothing compared to God's heart for the people. So my question, here's the thing is, how is it that Jonah can experience God's grace one minute and not rege- rejoice in others receiving the same thing the next? Because in his heart, there are those he determined were not worthy of the grace of God. How about us? Right? How many of you know Scripture talks about that we're to be people that pray for our enemies, right? Do you know you don't get to choose who your enemies are? When it says pray for enemies, that doesn't give us the right to choose the moniker and place the word enemy on somebody else. I've chosen you to be my enemy, so I will pray for you. Enemies are those that were actively seeking our demise, if you look at it in Scripture, but more to pray for those that persecute us, pray for enemies. Those aren't people that we get to make a list of and say, I've determined that you're my enemy, and so now I shall condescend to pray for you. Right? So what do you do with the grace of God that we've experienced? If you're in the room, you're breathing and have a pulse and claim Jesus as your Savior, you've experienced and walked daily in the grace of God. How could Jonah come to a place where he would proclaim, he would receive the grace of God and rejoice in it, but not be okay with it being extended to someone else. I got to tell you about (coughs) years ago, oh man, I was in my office one day and um, I was thinking about a situation, it was (laughs) family thing, right? Because you know, family. Mm Mm-hmm. And I remember the Lord speaking something to my heart and it was so painful because it was so true. And this is what he said to me. I was thinking about the situation of my family particularly. And the Lord said to me this. He goes, is there room in your heart for a redeemed version of them? And I went, I went, no. No. Because they were relegated in a section of my heart and mind that they did not know Jesus. They would never know Jesus. And the Lord's like, and is there room for a redeemed version of them? And my answer honestly was, nope. And at that moment I realized, well then, they're but probably needs, because I was faced with the exact same thing as Jonah. I was like, so there isn't room in my heart. I relegated them to a section in the unreachable section of my life. And that's what I was saying about the list. You know the list, the list of the people that will never, they are so far, Jesus couldn't find them with a telescope, people. In our hearts and minds, it could never be transformed or changed for whatever reason. And this is difficult. This is a difficult one, and I don't want it to be flippant. Because there are people that have truly caused us harm and pain in our life. And to say that God could forgive them and, and, and give them grace and redeem them is very, very hard because of the level of pain that they've caused. So I'm not being flippant nor cursory. I just know the transformative power of the cross. And we cannot, by the way... I've been in ministry for a while now. I have tried on all three roles of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I'm awful at all three roles. So are you. You're a lousy Savior. You're even a worst Holy Spirit. You're like, but I work real hard to convict people of their sin. Right? It doesn't work. 
So when we're talking about the grace of God and room in our hearts for that grace to be extended, it may simply mean a transformative work of the Spirit within our own heart to give room. It doesn't mean necessarily a restoring of relationship or that we're going to do anything, but the reality is if we're going to look at the story of God's grace through the book of Jonah and see his running from God and his, his unwillingness to proclaim the message because he doesn't want the grace of God to be extended to them, then we have to come back to ourselves and say, Jesus, do I sit there and I extend my hands praising you for the grace that you extend me, but there's a list of people that are unworthy in my heart to receive that grace for whatever reason. They could have hurt me, or it could be something as simple as they disagree with my personal opinion on something. They see the world differently than I do. Oh my gosh, they have a different political opinion than I do. right? People are like, please don't go there. <laughs> Listen to me. If the last two years have taught us anything, anything, is we better be kingdom. We better be people that extend the grace of God that we have received, and we are kingdom first before anything else, right? So when we look at Jonah, let's just bring it home. Here's the thing. This is why I started with this scripture, for God so loved the world, that he gave his one and only son, that whoever so believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For good, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. The reason why I started with that scripture and then went to Jonah and came back to it is because the heart of Father God has not changed. It was the same heart toward the people of Nineveh. His heart for this world, his heart for you and I. And the question is, what are you and I going to do with this grace? Will we accept his grace? Will we experience it? Will we live in it? Will we extend it? Or live our lives on the run from God's grace in a life where we worship a God of our own creation? Right? We recognize that, right? That idolatry is just worshiping a God of our own creation. So if I choose to change the things about God to fit my life, that's more of an idolatrous situation, right? Here's the thing about grace. I think the world that we live in, see, I just clicked that off. Now there's hope. I think the thing about God's grace, we read the book of Jonah, we see his grace in the Old Testament, his heart towards people, his heart towards us. I believe the grace of God is truly, as we are people empowered by the Spirit of God, this is, this is what transforms us, and this is what will transform the world around us. The message of God's grace, it always has been the message of his grace. It always will be the message of his grace. You cannot argue someone into a relationship with Jesus Christ. You certainly cannot hate someone into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And you really can't yell someone into a relationship with Jesus Christ. But we can love people up close and personal and watch the spirit of God do a work in their life as they experience his grace in us and through us. Amen. And that's not putting on a mask. That's just being who we are with Jesus. All the this all together, right? Listen, I, I just love that. I think I'm just, I'm so excited about when we get to look at the grace of God on display around us in our, as we worship him, as we relate to one another, because we're all those, we're all paintings, we're all works of art that display the works of God's grace in our life. That the world gets to come and see as well. Listen, I'm going to ask Pastor Aaron, oh, you're coming up here, he's going to come and he's going to close us out and Let's just be people of God's grace that receive it, are changed by his grace, and also are people that extend it in powerful ways. Can we just be open to what he would speak to us today about that and our grace? Thanks, man. Amen, amen. Thanks, brother. Church, would you stand to your feet all throughout this house? As I was praying through this message and just praying for you, I look out and I see called ones. Some of you have yet to fully accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and I want to encourage you that the grace of God is extending to you. And if the Holy Spirit has been tugging upon your heart to, hey, it's time for me to make a real commitment to Jesus Christ, I want to encourage you to make your way over to the prayer wall here, where we have folks that would love to pray with you and talk with you about what it means to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. But I also speak to those that are here today. The story of Jonah has been such a special one in my life because there was a point in my life where I was in ministry full time and I made a huge mistake. 
And uh, I had a lead pastor ask me to step down from ministry for what I was doing. And I thought I had lost my chance. And I thought I had, I was gone. But by the grace of God, I get to stand here today and I get to lead and I get to minister to God's people in this community because of God's grace. There's a calling that is upon your life. And I would ask you, how are you running from it? How can you identify yourself this week? And where is God calling you to go and to be in Jesus' name? Amen, amen, amen. Church, we love you so much. Have an incredible week, and we will see you next week.